Okay, so chapter four, important, demand, supply, and markets. We're gonna divide it up into two lectures. I think today we're gonna get through all of demand, and then hopefully we get through all of supply on Friday and part of markets, if not all. Um, the worksheet for Friday or Monday, I will post it on Friday and make it available so that you can print it or transcribe it or whatever onto a piece of paper and have it ready for Monday. So worksheets will be done and turned in on Monday. I'll make them available on Friday just for the whole like printing part of it. Okay. So let's get to demand. Demand's actually the easy part of this discussion because you are the ones that demand goods and services, right? And so you actually should know a lot of, about this already because it's really a discussion about it, okay? So demand by definition, the quantity consumers are willing and able to buy at each possible price during a given time period when other things remain constant. We're gonna go through every single bit of this and explain it to you, okay? So it is the amount that would be purchased per period. We have to pick a time period. It's demand for the day, for the week, for the year. Um, at Disneyland, I think they calculate demand in like 15 minute increments. Um, you just gotta pick a time period, doesn't matter what it is, okay? But it is how much would be purchased, not how much is, how much would be purchased at each possible price. So if we set the price at a dollar, how many would be purchased? And then what if we set the price at $2? How much would be purchased? We're, we're gonna pick one price, right? We haven't gotten there yet, but it's all of those prices and all of the quantities that would be purchased at those prices. Consumers must be willing and able, and able. This means that you must want the good, and you must have the money to buy the good. If you do not have either of those things, then you're not included in that the quantity consumers are willing. You, we wouldn't include you in those consumers. You have to have both of those, okay? A willingness and an ability to buy that thing. I have no interest. I don't have a dog. I wouldn't buy dog food no matter what the price was, right? Can I afford it? Yeah, but I don't want it. I don't have any willingness, right? And on the flip side, I don't have the ability to buy a $10 million yacht. Do I want one? Sure, right? You gotta have both. Specific time period we already talked about, other things remain constant. Okay, this is just a little disclaimer that says that basically we assume your taste for a good is the same throughout that given time period. So if the given time period is a week, I assume your taste for pizza, that's what we're talking about, your taste for pizza remains the same on day one as it does on day 30 or day 31. Might your taste for pizza change during that time period? Sure it might, but I can't account for that. That's, that, that's probably the biggest disclaimer on that. The law of demand says that the quantities demanded vary inversely with the price. That means they move in opposite directions. You already know this. As the price goes up, your demand for goods goes down and vice versa. As things get cheaper, you'll take more. As things get more expensive, you'll take less. That's the inverse relationship, okay? You already know this. All right. So. This is an extension of law of demand. We know there's this inverse relationship, right? When the price of a good falls, when a particular good becomes cheaper compared to other goods, so this is, this is a relative relationship. We're comparing the price of two goods, right? Consumers will tend to substitute that good for other similar goods. So if you walk into the grocery store and you see two goods next to each other that you consider substitutes, now that's a little subjective, right? 
to me, Coke and Pepsi are substitutes. I do not prefer one over the other. I don't care which one it is. For some of you, you're like, nope, not substitutes, right? So it's very subjective, but if one becomes cheaper compared to the other, and you do consider them substitutes, you're going to substitute the cheaper good in for the other one. Yeah, you do it all the time, right? I do walk into the grocery store if I'm looking for Coke or Pepsi, and I do pick the cheapest one because I simply don't care. For some of you, right? They're not substitutes. But for a lot of you, the name brand and the generic are gonna be substitutes. For some of you, they're not. But you know you do this, right? Remember that here we're talking about relative pricing. So we're not talking about something being cheap or expensive. We're talking about something being cheap Er, relative to the price of the substitute or of another good, okay? Some of you might be like, I don't buy Coke or Pepsi. I try and find the, the generic, you know, whatever. Yeah, that's fine too. Okay, so that brings us, we're still talking about some of those basic laws of demand. The law of demand, also part of it has to um takes into consideration incomes and how the price of goods affect a person's income so the income effect of a price change is also something that we need to consider with the law of demand and that is how an increase or decrease in the price of a good changes your buying power your ability to buy goods. We call this your real income. So if I say real income, I don't mean how many dollars you get every two weeks. I mean, how much purchasing power do you have with those dollars? Because the fact is, if I take you know, my paycheck that I get here in Flagstaff and I take it to San Francisco, it's not gonna buy nearly as much, right? So it actually doesn't matter how many physical dollars you have. It's actually much more important how much you can buy with those physical dollars, okay? So real income is the same as buying power. So a fall in a price of a good increases your real income or your buying power. You are able to then purchase more goods when prices fall, increasing your real income, your purchasing power, and the demand in this case the demand for normal goods would increase a normal good is a good that we buy more of when our income or buying power increases so it's things you buy more of when your income goes up or your buying power so either your real income or just your regular income right goes up we would buy more of these goods. What kind of goods would these be? What kind of goods do you buy more of if you have more money? Luxury items. Okay, could be luxury items, sure. What else? Definitely more Jimmy John's. <laughs> <laughs> more takeout, there you go. <laughs> okay, more Jimmy John's, more takeout, awesome. So food, more entertainment, entertainment. Thank you. Um, more name brand items. Great. It's the, the category is huge, right? We buy more clothes. We buy more cars. We buy more food. We buy more, right? Um, appliances. We buy more. It, the list goes on and on and on, right? Most goods are normal goods. We'll talk about the opposite here in a minute. Um, Here's, here's the opposite. An increase in the price of a good decreases your buying power or your real income. Consumers are then able to purchase less goods. So whether it's prices going up or your, which decreases your real income or your buying power, or you might just have a decrease in income, like regular income, both are gonna kind of cause the same scenario. You're just gonna be able to purchase less things. Your demand for normal goods is gonna decrease. So all those things we just talked about. But your demand for inferior goods 
is going to rise. Inferior goods are goods you buy more of the less money you have. What things do you buy more of the less money you have? Your college students, you are really good at this game. What are those things that college students buy? Because, you know, they're on a tight budget, they're trying to make it stretch, they want extra beer money, what? Sorry to stereotype. Um, yeah, ramen's a good thing, but, <laughs> okay, more beer, what kind of beer? Definitely Natty. What? Natty Light. <laughs> That's Never. the go-to. It is. Is it cheap? Oh, yeah. It's about $20. It's $16 and $20 okay. for a 30 Okay, there we go. Cheap booze, right? <laughs> this is amazing. Okay, I told you. Apparently, that. I'm too old for this. <laughs> I'm way too uh, I, 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 I have no idea what Natty is. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, so things like ramen, things like... Um, generic groceries, um, cheap beer, um, Little Caesars pizza, for God's sake, right? Disgusting. Um, <laughs> I think it's still cheaper to buy like a frozen pizza, honestly. Is it? Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, you guys are killing me right now. Okay. Um, a bus ticket would be considered an inferior good. And I would say like used goods in general. So like if you're going to, you know, thrift stores or whatever, those are going to be inferior goods. The less money you make, the more of those things that you buy. In this class, when I just throw out like the word goods or goods and services, I am, I am assuming that you understand I'm talking about normal goods. If I am talking about an inferior good, I will specifically point that out but because it's really such a small category of goods. When we talk about goods in general, those are really the goods we're gonna talk about, okay? All right. All right, so let's talk about graphing demand. It all comes down to the graphs in this class, okay? This is where it starts. It starts out really simple, pretty straightforward. And then it gets really gnarly, really fast. So please make sure if you have any trouble here that you let me know. Um, information is initially provided for demand in a schedule. And a schedule is just a place where it's, it's a physical chart where you would list possible prices for that good and then the corresponding quantity demanded. So it's just a way to collect your data before you graph it. After this chapter, we won't talk about demand schedules at all. I'll just show you a, a demand curve and we'll move on, okay? But I'm sort of showing you how that information sort of evolves. It, it does help some students. The demand curve will have all those possible prices and quantities on them. Demand curves are generally downward sloping. They have a negative slope. Not all demand curves are downward sloping. There are very, very small categories of goods that could have perfectly horizontal, perfectly vertical, or even upward sloping curves. We're not gonna really talk about those because they're so specific. Really, really, really high-end luxury goods actually have upward sloping demand curves. The, the more expensive they become, the higher the demand becomes because they become this sort of elitist good. Um, we're not gonna talk about, we're not gonna talk about a $10,000 handbag in this class just because it's such a small uh, classification or category of good. And, and we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more as the semester goes on. But I think when we, when we talk about demand curves in general, we're talking about a downward sloping demand curve, okay? Because of the inverse relationship between price and quantity, that's what we would expect to see, okay? All right, so let's look at one. And actually, pizza is our 
example here. So the demand schedule is that first thing that you see to the left. We have just randomly picked five prices. We could have picked a hundred different prices, a thousand different prices. Theoretically, $9 and $9 and one cent are two different prices. We're just gonna keep it simple, okay? So we picked five prices, and then you can see that next to it is corresponding quantity demanded at those prices. And you can see that inverse relationship. You can see as the price goes down, the quantity demanded goes up, and that's what we would expect to see, okay? All we've done is take those pairs of coordinates and we have graphed them. Graphs in econ will always be set up the exact same way. Price will be along your y-axis and quantity will be along your x-axis. It will always, always, always look that way, okay? All we've done here is we've taken that set of coordinates, $15 and 8 million pizzas, and $12 and 14 million pizzas. And we have plotted those points and simply connected them, developing a demand curve. Having a demand curve that is this perfectly beautiful, constantly sloped line D that you see here is very unrealistic. This line in reality has all sorts of up, it looks like a squiggle, right? It slopes in the downward direction. There's no way it really looks like this, okay? But it is the way that we represent it visually just because it's a lot easier for the eye and it's a lot easier for, for learning, as the case may be. So all we, it's the same information, right? A curve simply is made up of, diff, of, of points, a series of points, Every point along that curve D, between A and B, B and C, whatever, those are all possibilities too, okay? You don't have to pick whether you're gonna sell a pizza for 12 or 15, you can sell it for 13 or 14 or 13.50 or you know, 9.50 or whatever, right? And so all that does is it gives us a curve that now represents all the different possibilities of prices and then quantities demanded at those prices. Any questions about this? So far it's pretty simple, okay? Okay, so market demand. Market demand is the relationship between the price of a good and the quantity purchased at that price. We just talked about that. It's the demand in the market. Demand in the market is every single solitary combination that falls along that curve is market demand. Market demand is not one point on that curve. It's that whole thing, that whole thing, okay? It's all demand. It's the demand of all the consumers in the market, the consumers willing to pay low prices or high prices or whatever. Uh, it's limited to a given period of time. You always, on an econ graph, have to indicate what time period you're talking about. Um, usually we talk about it in weeks or months uh, when we're talking about demand in a market. It depends on the market. All other things remain constant. We already talked about that. Uh, we assume your tastes remain constant from one end to another. And market demand represents the sum of all individual demands in the market. So for example, if I said to you right now, how many of you would like a pizza at $15. And then I actually added up, and you were my market, you were the market, and I was selling pizzas, right? I would physically add up how many pizzas my market would demand at $15, and I would plot that point. And then I would say, how many of you uh, want a pizza at $12? And I would add it all up and I would plot that point. And it would tend to trend in the downward direction, right? Because the cheaper prices got, the more you would, the more you would demand in terms of quantity. So this is more conceptual than anything. 
we want to figure out demand in a market, we need to figure out how many everybody wants at the different prices and plot that. Okay? We'd basically be summing it up. Okay. Does quality affect the, those uh, graphs or is it kind of in a certain, uh, like, is it, uh, well, I don't know, does it affect the graphs quality? So are you saying maybe like the more pizzas I produce, maybe the lower quality they would be? Is that what you're yeah. thinking? Yeah, or like the $15 pizza is would be like from Pizza Coletta versus like the $12 pizza would be from Domino's, you know? Oh, yeah. No, I totally hear what you're saying. We're just talking about just a, a certain pizza. So, okay. so you're thinking about the market for all pizza everywhere. Yeah, that we could graph that too. And you absolutely, there would be a, right? I'm not going to touch that $5 pizza with a 10 foot pole, right? But there are $15 pizzas all over town I'd eat, right? Okay. So yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely quality. Thank what you. Happens, yeah, thank you. What happens when the individual consumers will demand a product no matter what the price like gas? Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there in chapter five, so hang on to that, okay? That has to do with something we call elasticity, but we'll get to that in chapter five. Okay, Colby, sorry, I don't mean to blow you off, but we'll get there, okay? So the demand curve moves. It's a moving target, just like a lot of things in econ, in that that entire curve can shift or move one way or another. And that shift is driven by primarily five factors. Depending on the class you're in, they could elaborate a little bit more on these factors and add another one or have less or combine a couple or whatever. But in this class, these are the five, okay? So right now, this is just a list. And then I actually have a slide for each one of these. And I'm going to go into it in more detail, okay? Because this is important. But if I was gonna, and I usually tell students they should memorize it, but now that you have online exams, I don't know that you need to memorize anything. Um, I would have this up front and ready for an exam, this list of five. No, it's not really that funny, okay? <laughs> I want you to memorize this, okay? But I'd have this available if I were you, okay? So, First one is consumer income. So when consumer incomes go up or down, obviously that drives their demand for good. And if the consumers in an entire market have a change in income, right? Because some new industry comes to town and everybody's making more money or because some big factory closes down and there's now lots of unemployed people, whatever it is, people's incomes see a big change that could shift demand in either direction. The other thing that could um, shift the demand for a good is the price of other goods. So we're talking about substitutes or complements. We'll get to that, okay? Like I said, I'm gonna elaborate on all these. Consumer expectations, changes demand, the composition of consumers who are the consumers in your market or the sheer number of consumers. And the third one is gonna be consumer taste. So let's go on to those specific slides and break it down. Okay, so change in consumer income. If we see an increase in consumer incomes, obviously that's gonna change the demand for goods, specifically normal goods, if we see an increase, okay? So it will change our willingness, but really our ability is what consumer income changes, our ability to buy more of each good at each price, creates an increase in demand for normal goods, and the demand curve would shift to the right or in the upward direction. Increases always happen to the right, not only with demand curves, but we'll, when we get into supply curves on Friday, you'll find that too. The numbers go up, quantity numbers go up from the origin. So zero, zero is your origin. As we move to the right, we get further and further and further away from zero, zero because numbers are increasing. So we see increases to the right and decreases to the left, okay? Um, with normal goods, we would see demand increase as income increases. 
with inferior goods, we would see demand decrease as income increases. I, you will buy less ramen and cheap beer when you get your first real job, I promise, okay? A decrease in income would create an opposite scenario. You would be less willing and able to buy goods. It would create a decrease in demand. The demand curve would shift to the left. You would demand less normal goods and more inferior goods. So it would be exactly the opposite scenario if we saw a decrease in it. Any questions? Okay. So here you've seen an in, here you see what would actually happen on a graph. If you saw an increase in the demand for pizza, right? That entire demand curve would shift to the right. You can see that prices really aren't changing. The quantity demanded at each price is really gonna change. You can see that at $12, after that demand curve shifts, $12, we would go from demanding 14 million pizzas in that market to then 20 million pizzas in that market. There's still $12 pizzas in the market. We're just buying more of them, okay? Because of that shift. All right, um, the effect, of price increases in other goods. So there are two types of goods. There are substitute goods and complementary goods. So when we're talking about a good in a market, there are substitutes and complements usually to that good. Not always, right? Substitute goods are goods, obviously, that we as an individual consider substitutes. An increase in the price of one good increases the demand for the other substitute good. So, for example, I consider Coke and Pepsi substitutes. An increase in the price of Coke makes the demand for Coke, in my mind, go down, and the demand for Pepsi would go up. So, an, goods are truly substitutes. An increase in the price of one would then increase the demand for the other, which now has a relatively lower price. Okay? Complementary goods, goods we use together. Here we're talking about um, hamburgers and hamburger buns, peanut butter and jelly, things like that, complementary goods. An increase in the price of one decreases demand for both. So if I go in to buy hot dogs, right, and the price has doubled, I am going to buy less hot dogs and hot dog buns. Because they are complementary goods, they really work in unison. They seem to, the market seem to react to prices and demand in the other market. If you go, if you're in business selling a good that is a substitute to another good, you got to be really careful because your good is so affected by another market. So people who produce hot dogs are usually not the same people who produce hot dog buns. So if you're getting into the hot dog bun market, you are really sensitive to somebody else's pricing decision in that other market. You've got to be careful, right? Um, and then we don't need to talk about unrelated goods because they are unrelated. Your author talks about them. What, is, what even is that? Okay, so consumer expectations. This is the third thing that we find shifts the demand curve. There are two types of consumer expectations, income and price expectations. What this first one is saying, this income expectations, is that, and we do this all the time, if you expect to get a raise, if you expect to get that first paycheck, et cetera, you'll actually begin spending the money now before you actually have it in your hands. On the inverse, if you expect to lose your job in two weeks, that will also change your demand today. So we will actually change demand for goods today based on a future income expectation. Even though it hasn't happened, it's what we expect to happen. We will um, make decisions accordingly. The other one is price expectations. And expectations that a price is going to increase or decrease, right? Decrease is gonna be the opposite. Uh, an expectation of a price increase increases current demand for a good. So if you expect the price of a good to go up next week, next month, you'll actually buy more of it today based on that expectation. 
why don't why don't we sell a lot why don't they sell a lot of big screen tvs in the month of october it's statistically true because of black friday thanks lexi because we expect that in november the price of big screen tvs is going to be lower than any other time of the year is it guaranteed no but it's an expectation okay so that changes current demand based on future expectations great thank you composition of consumers an increase in the sheer number of consumers would obviously increase demand for a good and shift it to the right so we're talking about a huge influx of people into your economy. This happens in Flagstaff every August, right? We have a huge influx of consumers and the demand for really almost everything increases. And we see demand curves shift dramatically to the right, right? Because our population increases by 25% or something here in Flag. A change in the composition of consumers also does the same thing. And when I say composition, I'm talking about the demographic. What kind of people are there? Every August, they take my target, right, mine, and they fill it with all kinds of stuff because then it becomes yours, right? They fill it with stuff I don't buy. I don't buy little freestanding microwaves. I don't buy shower caddies. I don't buy body pillows or kitchens in a box or I don't buy all that XL twin sheets. I don't buy that. Right. But the demographic changes in a way that demand for those goods shifts. And they put them in that target for you. Right. So composition of consumers changes demand for certain goods and services or goods and services in general, depending. Okay. All right. Um, consumer taste. So this is the fifth one. And this is the one that's pretty hard to predict. And especially, especially with social media, this, this is that category of shift that social media targets. Is they try and create demand for goods and services that you didn't think you needed, but it tries to do it in a pretty very quick, very efficient way, right? Social media tries to get you to demand things you didn't know you demanded until the minute you see it show up, right? That's the point. So this is marketing, consumer taste. Um, consumer tastes are the likes and the dislikes of the population. We assume they are consistent along the demand curve, okay? We already talked about this. We consume that we assume that if you like something, you like it, and if you don't, you don't, right? Um, a change in the taste of the population can shift the demand curve either direction. So, if we can make people think they need something or they like it, right, we can shift that demand curve to the right or increase it. And the opposite can happen as well if we decide we dislike something. What is something? that had, and, and there are a few, that had a dramatic shift to the left because of social media. Like we stopped demanding it, we didn't want it anymore. Plastic straws are a great example, right? Yeah, plastic straws. How did social media do that? posted a picture of a turtle with a straw up its nose, right? And it got a lot of buzz. And all of a sudden, you and I decided of all the crap, right, that we throw in the ocean, we're going to focus on one of the smallest ones, right? The straw. Listen, it's great. I don't use that many reusable straws anymore either. Or no, sorry, the opposite, <laughs> disposable straws. Um, I use more reusable straws. I get it. It's great. It's awesome. That is a social media thing, right? That drove that dislike for the product and therefore decrease in demand for that product. But we see it happen all the time. 
Did they also make laws about, absolutely they made laws about uh, plastic straws in some areas. Listen, folks, we are putting a lot of stuff in the ocean. And yeah, plastic straws are a problem, but it's plastic. That's the problem, right? It's all the stuff. It's all the disposable stuff. Straws are the, probably the least of our worries. But social media drove that very dramatic shift in demand. Okay, I know we're out of time. This is the list you already saw. This is just like a recap of that list in a normal class, right? It would be another reminder that I needed you to memorize it, but now it's just another reminder that it's a good thing to write down and have next to you during the exam. Okay.